morning. And welcome to worship as we gather on this Sunday in the presence of God as his family. Today is a time when we commemorate with churches around the world Reformation Day weekend, where we remember the precious gift of salvation freely given. Locally, this is also a time where we commemorate Parents Weekend, where we remember the precious gift of a college education not freely given. And we're just thankful for you parents who are here and for this time as families to enjoy once again the presence of each other and now to worship side by side in this place. And if you're a guest with us, we pray that you will welcome, be welcomed in this place and feel that you are part of our family as well. Just as a reminder, because it's Reformation Day weekend, this evening we will not have a, a service here. We will have a combined Reformation Day service in the B.J. Han at 6 p.m. And so we're all invited back to worship tonight with churches around this area as we celebrate the free gift of God's grace. But again, that's going to be in the B.J. Han at Dort College at 6 p.m. this evening. With that word of reminder, let's open this service in prayer. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we, by grace, are part of your family. That because of the finished work of Jesus, we can call you Father. And because we can call you Father, we can look around this place and realize that each one here is a brother and a sister. Lord, that we are part of the family that you have formed. Heavenly Father, we thank you that this same family stretches through this world and includes the nations. We pray that today you would give us eyes to see the breadth of your kingdom. You would give us a heart to comprehend the depth of your grace. Heavenly Father, that you would strengthen us that we could serve you now in a new week as your family active in your world. Father, we pray each of these things in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, would you please stand for our call to worship. God calls us to worship today from Revelation 15. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Let us join together singing praise to God. God's holy ways are just and true.
God that we praise is the very one who is present and who greets us with these words. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of you, now and forevermore. Amen. Friends, as God has gathered us in this place, would you please greet those around you. If you're with your parents, give them a hug. If you're not with your parents, give someone else's parents a hug. And welcome to this place. Let's remain standing. In Psalm 62, David tells the story of our mighty God when he says, Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I shall not be shaken. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Let's continue in praise, responding to David's invitation to pour out our hearts to our refuge, singing, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. be seated. On this Reformation Sunday, we remember perhaps those famous words that Martin Luther spoke, here I stand, I can do no more. Our next song is a, an older song, but it reflects that sentiment. The words, Jesus is my Savior, I shall not be moved. Let's sing this together.
Shall we pray? Lord God, you have said in your word, Woe to those who carry out plans that are not mine, that are not by my spirit, heaping sin upon sin. We confess that we are often impatient and we run ahead of you. We take matters into our own hands, turn to other sources for rescue from our problems, or we manipulate situations to satisfy us for the moment. Our lack of trust leads to all kinds of sins of thought, word, and deed. Lord, we know that all our human efforts to save ourselves are futile. Instill in us quietness and trust, the desire to be still and wait on you. You are our God. We humbly bow before you and plead for your mercy. For the sake of Jesus, amen. We invite you to join us in singing, Be Still My Soul. Yeah. 
pardon for Matthew 7, 24, and 25. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like, a ma like the wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. Please stand with us and sing the solid rock.
this Reformation Sunday weekend, we are invited to build our lives on that solid rock. And that is the rock of obedience to the word of God that we are given. And I invite you to turn with me in that word this morning in the beginning of our Bibles, the book of Genesis, and we are in chapter 16 today. Genesis 16, 1 through 16, and that is on page 13 in your pew Bibles. If you have a preferred version or another Bible with you, you're welcome to open those as well. Genesis 16. If you are a guest with us for Parents Weekend or for another reason, this fall what we are doing as a church is we are exploring what faith is. And we're not doing that in the abstract, trying to define faith and look at eight challenges to faith. We're doing that in the concrete. We are looking specifically at how is faith expressed in human life. And we're looking at that through the life of a man named Abram. And we're seeing how this faith, how is it created? How is it sustained? How does it survive in the midst of disappointments and waiting and struggle? And we're answering that by walking with this man, Abram, through the course of his life. And we're hopefully seeing as we're walking with Abraham that faith is a long journey and there's a lot of bends in the road and we don't know where we're going. And yet we're seeing that God is shaping this man so that in Romans 4.11, he would be called the father of all who believe. But today we're going to see not only is he the father of all who believe, he is also the father of some who don't believe. And we see that in our world today. If you watch the news, you might notice that there's a lot of articles speaking of the conflict right now between the Jews and Israel and their Arab neighbors. There are headlines like this one, violence escalates in Jerusalem and the West Bank. This is from this week. On Friday, I read an article in the New York Times that had some of the music that is being sung in Jerusalem today. And it had some of the music videos. This is a couple of screenshots from music videos. There's one with a, 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 someone holding a huge sword in front of the Dome of the Rock, and the song goes, Rule with the knife against your enemy. Another song video, this is a screenshot, and the catchy lyrics is, Stab, stab the Zionist and say God is great. This is from Kanye, actually, released this one. No, he didn't. No, this is a terrible song. And yet this is the songs that are sung in Jerusalem today, and they're being sung by Arabs and by Jews who are together attacking one another. My wife and I were there just a couple of weeks ago, and we were within hours in the very places where these attacks were happening, either just before or just after we were there. This is a blood feud, but it's a blood feud between brothers. And I want us just to notice today that this conflict in the Middle East in this very moment has its roots in this chapter of Scripture. Today's Middle East has its roots in Genesis chapter 16 and the children that Abraham bore. And with that before us, let's understand the world we live in through God's word. Would you pray with me for God to speak to do that? Would you pray? Heavenly Father, you have searched us and you know us. You know when we sit and when we rise, you perceive our thoughts from afar. And yet today we would lay again our lives before you and before your living word. And we ask that once again you would search and that you would know us. Heavenly Father, that if there is any offensive way in us, that you would lead us in your way everlasting. Speak, Lord, and in your speech may we see Jesus. For we pray in his name. Amen. Genesis 16. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan ten years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian maidservant, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, You are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my servant in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your servant is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. 
Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. He said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from? Where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now with child, and you will have a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Be'er Lahai Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Brothers and sisters, some of you may know what was celebrated this week, Wednesday, on October 21, 2015. Anyone know what was celebrated on Wednesday? Back to the Future Day. Yes. Anyone celebrate that with me? Back to the Future Day. It is the day where we remember the 1989 release of a movie set in 1985 where Marty McFly and Doc Brown go to the future 30 years and they arrive on October 21, 2015. On that Wednesday, this past Wednesday, my wife and I watched this movie uh, at night. We thought it would be just kind of fun to watch. I don't know if any of you did. And we were struck that they blew some predictions about what the world would look like. They incorrectly thought we'd have flying cars and hoverboards, and they incorrectly predicted the Cubs were going to win the World Series. But they were really close on a lot of things. They correctly predicted flat screen TVs and video conferencing and drones. They predicted that movies would be 3D, and they predicted Jaws 19, which hasn't happened. But tomorrow in London is the release of James Bond 24, so they got the sequel thing down. And they even predicted something that I thought was pretty incisive. They, they predicted that in 2015, there would be this egomaniac, really rich man named Biff, who would build a tower and name it after himself, who would have big hair, who would have a surgically altered wife. I'm going to leave it to you if that prediction actually came true. But the premise of Back to the Future is this, that, or the plot really turns on the fact that there's a character who has a sports almanac and is able to go back in time. And the premise behind this plot device is this, that if you could know the future, if you could live in the past with the knowledge and the perspective of what's going to come, you would be powerful. That there's a power in knowing what's going to come as you live in the present. That whole idea is caught in the slogan that many of us know that hindsight is 2020. That if we could just have the perspective of the future, we could live well in the present. Hindsight is 2020. Now, as we think about all that, I think that's how a lot of us read Scripture, and it's how we read passages like Genesis 16. We know exactly how this story ends up. We know about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. We have read the story of the Old Testament. We know the prophets. And we know that in the fullness of time, Jesus comes. And with our 2020 hindsight, we read Genesis 16, and we are shocked and scandalized by how stupid these characters are and by how unimaginably sinful their actions are. But I want to suggest when we use our hindsight to read this passage. We distance the characters from ourselves, and in so doing, we distance their struggles from our own struggles. And we miss the missiness of faith. And so today I want us to put a pause on our hindsight and to try to enter into this story from the perspective of Abram and Sarai. And as we do, what we notice right away in verse 1 is they are confronted with a major problem. 
That problem, we're told in verse 1, is that Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. Now, that's a personal problem. If you've ever, and some of us have struggled with infertility, you know the frustration and the quiet shame and the questioning that that occasions. And that was their questions and their shame. But it wasn't just the personal, it was also the cultural. In that day and age for Sarai, to be a woman was to bear a male heir. That was your purpose, that was your identity, that was your worth. A barren woman was a worthless woman. Now before in your hindsight you judge that culture too harshly, remember that Tim Keller points out that really every culture judges women who are barren. We just define what barrenness is. Back then it was not having children. Maybe today it's not looking pretty enough or not being successful enough in your career, or whatever it is that culture says, this is how you become a worthwhile woman. And she has failed at that. But it's not just personally and culturally, this is also a problem spiritually. Because Abram and Sarah had left their home on the power of the promise of God. And that promise that they would have descendants as numerous as the stars, and now 10 years in, they have nothing to show for it. And so the barrenness begs the question, is God really going to keep his promise. So that's the problem. And then we read in the very next line, there's an opportunity to meet the problem. This is what she sees. But she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. Sarai is barren, but she has a servant. There is an available womb in the vicinity. She may not be able to contribute her own egg, but she can contribute her employee. So she's cratch- she hatches an idea. And so in the next verse, we see this barren woman conceives of a plan. And that plan is this. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Now there's an irony in this plan. You remember earlier in the story, when Abram was in Egypt, he gave his wife to an Egyptian, Pharaoh. Now when Sarai is in Canaan, she's giving her husband to an Egyptian, named Hagar. Kind of an irony there. But the question is, how in the world can a 75-year-old woman convince her husband to sleep with a young, nubile, olive-skinned, exotic young girl? How could she convince him to do that? Somehow she prevails. Abraham agreed. Not a lot of argument at his point. Hey, Abraham, how about you sleep with, hey, oh, I'll leave you two alone, right? He just goes right to it. And he sleeps with Hagar, and then we find out this whole plan works. Verse 4. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived, and so happily ever after we live. Sarai was barren. Now through her servant, she has conceived a a child. Soon enough, there'll be the pitter-patter of little feet in the tents of Abram and Sarai. This is exactly what she wanted. Everything is good. Except for little by little, things begin to demonstrate that they're not good. Maybe it started one morning when Sarai was in bed and she asked Hagar to come bring her breakfast like usual. But this time Hagar said, ah, you know, little morning sickness today, you get your own breakfast. Remember, I'm pregnant. Maybe it was those little barbs that she threw out. Wow, Sarai, you look really good for 75. Look how flat your tummy is. My belly's swollen because I've got a baby. And it's just these little needling comments. This way that Hagar is showing that now she is the superior one. She's the woman with worth. And in fact, we read in the text, not only is she doing that, but we read that when she became pregnant, she despised her mistress. The word there in Hebrew is the same word from chapter 12, curse. She treats her mistress, Sarai, with loathing. And so this whole plan has destroyed the relationship between Sarai and Hagar, but it also begins to eat away at the relationship between Sarai and Abram. Notice what she says in verse 5. Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. Not very fair. It was her idea, but husbands, has that ever happened to you? But then she says, I put my servant in your arms. Think how conflicted Sarai is. This was her idea. She is the one who conceived of this. And yet, now exactly what has happened that she was hoping, she now has a child through Hagar, but she has to see the pain of her husband and this slave girl who now share her bed and share so much more. She has to watch her husband, Abram, run out for errands to get some pickles and ice cream for Hagar. 
She has to see their shared glances and know that her marriage bed is forever crowded. That phrase, I put my servant in your arms, literally means I put her in your lap. It's a graphic phrase, but it shows the depth of her suffering. And so Sarai has this plan, and now it's all unraveling. And so she comes to her husband again, and he is once again passive. He doesn't do anything except for say, whatever, she's in your hands. Do whatever you want to do to her. And so Sarah does exactly what she wants to do. She takes out all of those years of frustration and her anger at herself and at God and at Abram, and she takes it out on this little girl named Hagar. And how are we, without hindsight, to understand what's going on? Well, one way that some scholars read this text is to say what's really happening here, every one of these characters is sinful, but there's one who's especially guilty, and that is actually Abram. So what we see in this passage is Abram is being too passive as a man. They say, look at the structure of the passage. At two different points, the structure is Sarai initiates something, Abraham passively goes along with it, and then trouble ensues. She initiates sleeping with Hagar, he does, there's conflict. She initiates a complaint, he passively says she's in your hands, and then there is this abuse. That what we see here is Sarai is taking charge of the family, not Abram. And scholars point out that's not just in the structure of the text, it's in the grammar. That the verbs used to describe Sarah are the same verbs in the same order as Eve in Genesis 3. Sarai took and she gave to her husband and he slept just like Eve took and gave to her husband and he ate. This is a new fall. And it's because Abram, like Adam, was not the man of the house. He didn't take his rightful role. And so after exegeting this text and studying all the scholars and working through the Hebrew, my conclusion for this text is what it's teaching us is that men shouldn't listen to their wives. I tried that interpretation out with my wife earlier in the week, and she just smiled at me and said, Pilate didn't listen to his wife either. And he crucified the Lord of the universe. <laughs> so maybe that's not what it's saying. But what it's certainly showing us is Abraham is the patriarch. He is the one to whom the promises of God have come. He is the one who has heard God speak. He is the one last week who we saw stood there in between the bloody carcasses and watched as God himself covenanted with him. And yet in this story, he is absolutely out of it. He didn't say no when his wife had this bad plan. He doesn't intervene when Hagar is mistreating his wife. He doesn't assure Sarai of his love. He doesn't reconcile between Hagar and Sarai. He lets Sarai abuse this woman he's just slept with. So much so that she and her, his unborn baby are cast into the desert. He is absolutely passive. And the result of that passivity is destruction in his family that ripples through the ages. That's part of it. But there's a deeper story here. The deeper story is not a problem in Abraham's authority. It is a problem in his faith. What's going on here is Abram has a promise. And God has said in the very chapter before this that it is through your body that I will accomplish this. You're not going to have to adopt anyone or do anything else. I'm going to give you a child through your flesh and blood. And he is one flesh with Sarai. And yet what we see in this event is that Abraham's faith falters. Because he can either wait for his old wife to get pregnant, which will mean he has to depend on God's supernatural power, or he can just, for 15 minutes of pleasure, do something with his servant girl and make a baby his own way. He can wait in the promise, or he can do it in his own strength. That's his choice. And scholars are clear about what choice he made. Going back to John Calvin on this Reformation Sunday, Calvin said this, Sarai, through impatience of long delay, resorted to a method of obtaining seed by her husband at variance with the word of God. The faith of both was defective. Reformation Study Bible, R.C. Sproul, says similarly, in her impatience, Sarah tried to fulfill the divine promise through her own initiative. Another Old Testament scholar, Sarai's plan, however, was one, of more, one more example of the futility of human effort to achieve God's blessing. Bruce Waltke says, the characters clash with each other and themselves trying to engineer their own fulfillment of the promises. And then finally, Walter Brueggemann, 
Abram tries to take the promise into his own hands again, unwilling to wait for God. Such agreement among scholars that that's what the story is teaching us because that is what the New Testament says. In Galatians chapter 4, Paul is arguing with the church about how we are saved. Is it by works or is it by faith? And he points to this text, and this is what he says in chapter 4. For it is written that Abram had two sons. The son by the slave woman, Hagar, was born the ordinary way. The son by the free woman was born as a result of the promise. He is contrasting those two ways. Is God's promise accomplished in our own strength or in God's strength? Is it through Hagar or Sarai? Is it by works or is it by faith? Is it by law or is it by grace? Is it by human achievement or is it by receiving from God's hand? How does God's promise come to the world? And the answer, of course, is by grace, through faith. And this is not of yourselves, it is a gift. That's why Genesis 16 is a perfect text for Reformation Sunday because it's hammering home that reformational promise that we are saved and that God's promise comes to this world even when it looks like it's not, not because we bring it in by our strength or our scheming or our engineering, but as a gift of grace and God's power. That's the point. And yet even in that point, I think if we in our hindsight apply that Reformation truth to this text, even then I think we miss it. Because that truth is real, but to apply it too neatly to these people who don't know the Reformation and they don't know Jesus is to again separate their struggle from our own. You see, you and I are scandalized by what Abram and Sarai have done. We couldn't imagine inviting some strange person into our marriage bed to conceive a baby with our spouse. We couldn't imagine that. But for Abram and Sarai, what they did was not only normal and accepted, It was, in their understanding, required. Archaeologists have found prenuptial agreements from this time period. Marriage contracts that both people signed. We found lots of them, and this is what some of them say from this period. If Gilliam Ninu, this woman, bears children, then her husband shall not take another wife. But if the wife fails to bear children, the wife shall get a woman from the Lulu country as a concubine. In the prenup, it's you will provide me with a child, and if you don't, you provide me with a maidservant. It was required in the contract. Another Assyrian marriage contract of the 19th century BC. This man took this woman, um, but within two years she has not procured offspring for him, then she may buy a maidservant. Two years is all you wait. Sarah had waited ten. What Abram and Sarah are doing here is not some shocking scandalous thing they are doing what they think they have to do they are understanding the promise and they're trying to live it out the best way they can and when you see that maybe the story takes on new meaning for us earlier i preached about genesis 12 when abram in the midst of a severe famine goes to egypt and the point of that sermon was abram failed to trust that in the point when the promise of God was challenged by famine, he leaves to do what he thinks he can control rather than letting God control. And the point of my sermon is we need to wait on God and not jump the gun, not push things forward. And one of you, after the sermon, texted me with an honest question. Does that mean that we just have to be passive? If this is what faith is, that we just need to wait on God, does that mean that we should never take any initiative that we shouldn't risk engineering our own blessing. Because if that's what we mean, what does that look like? You've all heard the story of the man caught in a hurricane like Patricia, who was promised by God that he would be saved. And as the hurricane bore down, a neighbor came by in a pickup truck and honked the horn and said, come quick, we gotta escape. And the man said, no, 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 God's promised I'll be safe. The water began to rise in the street and the National Guard comes through in a Humvee and they say, you need to come with us and evacuate. No, 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 God's promised I'll be safe. The water rises. Eventually a boat comes by. Come on in. The water's rising. You need to leave. No, 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 God's promised I'll be safe. Eventually on his roof a helicopter comes as the water's up to the ceiling. You've got to leave. No, God's promised I'll be safe. The water rises and he dies. And he goes to heaven and he says, God, you promised I'd be safe. Why did you fail me? And God said, I sent you a truck, a Humvee, a boat, and a helicopter. It's your fault. 
Now what if Abraham is fearing he'll get up to heaven and say, God, you promised me offspring. And God's going to say, I sent you Hagar and Heather and Hillary. It's your fault. How do you know when the promise of God takes initiative? And how do you know when to wait? And it's not easy. How do you know whether you should adopt or whether you should wait on God for a birth to come? Or simply accept your fact that you should not have children. How do you know? How do you know? I think this text doesn't solve that tension. It points us to the mystery that we are to love God with all of our mind, and yet we are not to lean on our own understanding. That the life of faith requires bold obedience, like leaving your country and family, but also the bold passivity of waiting in a land in the midst of a famine, and waiting in the midst of barrenness. That we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, but it is God who works in us to will and to do his good purpose. That's the tension of the Reformation, and it's in this text. But maybe this text is showing us something else. Maybe it's showing us that we can't live in our own sight because we don't know the future. Nor can we live by hindsight because we don't have a sports almanac of the future. And if we can't live by our own sight or by hindsight, we need to live in a different sight. And that's the point of this text. And it shows it in a beautiful way. Everyone here is guilty, but there's one person who's really the victim, and that's Hagar. Hagar, remember, was a slave. She was ripped from her family, from her mother, from her father, from her siblings, and given to this Canaanite family in Egypt. And then when they're kicked out of the country, she is ripped from her own land and brought to a land she knows nothing about. And in this text, no one asked Hagar's opinion. No one asked if she really likes this plan. Instead, an 85-year-old man forces himself upon her. And then her powerful mistress abuses her. That word mistreat is actually the same word as Exodus 111 for what the Egyptian slave owners will do to the Egyptian slaves in the future. She is abused verbally, possibly physically. She is what we would call raped. She is also, in this text, never referred to directly by any of the human characters. And in all the times when they talk about her, Abram and Sarai never use her name. Sarai says, the slave girl, my servant, is in your arms. And Abram responds, not by Hagar, but by, well, your servant, do what you want with her. They completely make her an object. She is not in their eyes. She has no name. And so she runs away. And yet in the desert, notice what happens. In the desert, she is met by the angel of the Lord. That being occurs 58 times in the Old Testament. This is the very first appearance. And scholars say likely this is pre-incarnate Jesus Christ who finds her in the desert. And after living a life where no one knows her name and no one speaks to her, what does the angel of the Lord do? He speaks to her by name. Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? This is the only time in the entire Old Testament where God speaks to a woman by name, and it's to a servant girl. In fact, in the ancient Near East, this is the only time any deity speaks to any woman by name, and it's to the servant Hagar. And then the angel of the Lord who comes to her and knows her by name tells her to go back to her home, but he does so with a promise that echoes the promise he gave to Abraham, the man of faith. I will increase your offspring too numerous to count. He gives her the same promise to this weak servant girl. And then he gives a birth announcement. The very first birth announcement by an angel in Scripture it echoes the announcement that will come to Mary 2,000 years later. And he says, your son's name will be Ishmael, and that means God hears. That every time this servant girl would call her little boy, every time she would call his name for supper, every time she would call his name when he was bad, she would say, Ishmael, God hears. And the reminder that God hears her cry too. And the God who knows her name and knows her voice also knows the destiny of her child. He knows that Ishmael will cause conflict and that will reverberate through the ages even to our day. And with that foresight of the future in her present, Hagar realizes something profound and she puts it in the name of God. She says, God is the one who sees This is the only time in all of Scripture when someone names God. And it's a weak servant who realizes that in the midst of a broken world that no one sees her in, 
God sees her. Friends, maybe that's the point of this text. We can't live by our own sight. And we can't live by hindsight, which is 2020. But we do live within the sight of God. The God who sees the slaves and the weak and the oppressed of the world. The God who sees the barren woman like Sarai struggling to hold on to the promise. The God who sees passive men like Abraham who caused such pain in his family. The God who sees it all. Whose eye is on the sparrow and yet the God who will bend all of these broken people into a world of his making by grace and by mercy. And that's the point of this marvelous story. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you this Reformation Sunday and we thank you that we are not saved by our work, by our engineering of your promise, by our effort, but we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And this is not of ourselves. And yet as we struggle to hold on to this deep truth, we pray for wisdom as we live in this world, for wisdom to be bold and to take action when you are calling us to do that, for wisdom to wait and trust when your spirit calls us to be still. And Heavenly Father, in all these things, we thank you that we don't live by our sight, but we live under you, the God who sees. So see us now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, in the midst of a broken world with so much sin, we see in this text the God who sees, looks on us with mercy. Our song of response is, Merciful God, would you stand as the music begins?
friends, you may be seated. And we come to this merciful God now in a time of prayer as the family of God. Would you pray with us? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the God who sees, that you are the God who hears, who hears the cry of the hurting and the oppressed. The very weakest ones of this world are the ones that your ear inclines especially to, that you know the Hagars of this world by name, and the bitter Sarai's and the helpless Abram's in each of us, that you see us, that you search us out, that you hem us in behind and before Heavenly Father, we thank you for the way that you have seen fit to bless us in this place. We thank you again for the beauty of these autumn days. We thank you for the fellowship of Parents Weekend and of family gathered around. And Lord, for those of us without family nearby, we thank you for the family of faith. Gracious God, we thank you for the bounty of your blessings to us, of barns and silos and wagons overflowing with grain, of schools overflowing with children of a church overflowing with the gifts that you give. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the leaders you give in this church and even for the calling you are placing on hearts already for new care and concern group coordinators and elders and deacons. Lord, we thank you for those who teach our children catechism in Sunday school and youth group. We thank you for the staff of this church. We thank you for the missionaries who have gone out from this place to bring the name of Jesus and to tell of the one who sees to the margins of this world where so many live in the shadows. Heavenly Father, we thank you as a community that you call us to worship you together. We praise you for the combined Reformation Day service tonight and for the symbol of unity that that gives us. We thank you with the United Reformed Church and Pastor Brad Niemeyer for the work that you're doing in and through them. We pray your blessing on that congregation. And Father, in the midst of these praises, we also do thank you that you see us in our pain. So we lay before you those in Mexico and Texas whose lives have been disrupted by Hurricane Patricia. We pray that you would bring mercy, that you would protect life and property, but also in this time, give your peace. Heavenly Father, we do pray in the Middle East where the sons of Isaac and the sons of Ishmael, both descendant from Abraham, even this day find no peace. We pray that as Abraham was passive, that your spirit and your church should be active as agents of reconciliation, as ambassadors of the gospel, of forgiveness and of grace. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your eyes see Alan and Phyllis Buchelman through this week after surgery on Monday. We pray that in your time you'd restore Alan home and to full mobility and to strength again. May you give him and Phyllis patience in this process. Heavenly Father, we pray that you continue to give healing to Joyce Heinen, that you would continue to bless those of us who are struggling from injuries and recent surgeries, who are dealing with chronic conditions, Parkinson's, heart disease, cancers. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would continue to watch over our young people as well as they make decisions in your world. May you lead them in your way. May they know when to wait and when to walk. Heavenly Father, we do pray that you would especially today have your eyes turned to those whose eyes are filled with tears. Continue to pray for Randy and Brenda Brignanhill and the loss of her father. We pray in this week for the Bacom family who recently lost a mother and now has lost their father as well. We pray that your peace would surround them as they make arrangements for a memorial service. As this last generation of the immigrant family goes and a new generation takes up their place in your kingdom. Heavenly Father, we continue to pray for Cheryl Hoagland as she buried a father in this week. We pray for so many in this community who have lost loved ones in this past month. May your eyes see us and your hands hold us. So, Father, hear these prayers. Hear also the cries of our heart that we make in the desert places of this world. Remind us that you are the God who names children Ishmael, the God who hears. For we offer these prayers in thanksgiving and trust in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen. All right. Offerings now go first for the ministries of this church and denomination around the world, the second for Christian education. On this Reformation Day Sunday, as we give, we'll hear a new version of a song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Just 
As those saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, as those who live in a world knowing that it is God who sees, we go with God's blessing as he turns his face towards us. And after that, our doxology is the new doxology. We'll sing together, and then I invite you to fellowship after this service and to enjoy the presence of God through his people. But friends, go forth in God's world with this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and see you and give you peace. Amen.